Welcome back to the Papa Me channel. How you doing? How you doing? Come on and sit on down. Today I did another ranking video where we sit down and watch all the movies in a franchise in a row. And today's was Insidious. James Wan's Insidious. Bloomhouse's Insidious. Yay! The first movie came out around 2010. If you weren't around those times, if you were just a, still a sp in your dad's big hairy b let me tell you how it was. This movie blew up super, super big. And I think this is like one of the first movies, this along with The Purge, were like the two Blumhouse movies that were like extreme commercial successes and it really paved the way of what the Blumhouse method would be, which is make a movie for next to nothing in the grand scheme of things, and then make like a hundred plus million dollars in profit, which the first Insidious, I, even I was shocked. As, looking it up, $1.5 million for the first one and it made a hundred million the in the box office. Crazy. And this movie, I think it's like ranked is the scariest film ever based off of like participants like heartbeat like their heart racing or whatever so i was curious because the fifth one the red door that comes out soon so it got me thinking i haven't watched these movies in forever why not roll down memory lane and see if how these movies hold up which there are four insidious one insidious chapter two insidious chapter three and then insidious four which is the lost key last key which is the last key sounds like a chronicles of Narnia book. And those are the four. So I thought, you know what? It's not not as crazy as the paranormal activity. It's not as crazy as Final Destination and number. So you know what? Let's give it a shot. And, uh, you know, uh, watching through these, it's remarkable how, in my opinion, how poorly not only is it how these aged, but how bad every script of this series is. It's pretty remarkable, actually. It's, it's pretty unbelievable how cheesy the scripts get, which well, I'll try to give example, cite my sources along the way. But without further ado, what's the worst Insidious film. Easy! Insidious Chapter 3. Are you longing for more TMNT content? Maybe some of the fun, goofier sides of the 90s TMNT costumes, or even some of the new cutting-edge animation with Mutant Mayhem? Well, my friend, you're in luck. With Match Masters! Match Masters is a mobile game that shakes up everything you know about match games by pitting you head-to-head -head against friends or opponents around the world in a race to score most points before the time runs out. Plan out your game plan over the course of rounds and use powerful boosters to your advantage to swing the match in your favor. Ooh, Match Masters has me so excited I can't stop playing. And right now is the best time to play because it has some excellent features like TMNT emotes and new outfits for your avatar. Plus, there's also over 40 TMNT stickers to collect and of course, special limited time TMNT events. So much turtle power. So use the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description below to download Match Masters and get free limited edition TMNT game items when you do. And thank you Match Masters for sponsoring this video and of course, back to the video. Insidious Chapter 3, it's like the first movie that branches away from the normal family. I already forgot what their names were. The Lamberts. What was the name of the old bitch? Elise. I'm pretty sure after the second movie, Elise, the old woman, her name is Lynn Shay. She's a fucking amazing. She's also in Detroit Rock City as the super Christian mom, and she's also the, like, hotel landlord, and she does a very disgusting pussy-eating scene, because Woody Harrelson has to eat her pussy out in uh, Kingpin, which is a great bowling film. She's, like, she's born with this crazy gift and her husband killed himself and she's you know she's been locked away in her house forever so this is her getting back out into the game of helping people through paranormal activities as it were yeah it's like it's kind of like a you know what kind of tale would that be what is it like a i don't know it's a fucking movie where the bitch comes back and she starts working again it's like big, big mama's, mama's house it's big mama's house the fucking oh. horror movie except it, that doesn't track at all so that doesn't make sense it doesn't matter lynn shay is pretty much the rock of the insidious franchise I think that as soon as, uh, spoilers, they figured out that we really shouldn't have killed her off. They decided to just do a kind of a fresh reset and do a prequel series in chapter three, which whenever I was watching it, I was like, why would we call it chapter three then? It's like, if anything, can it just be like insidious the beginning? It, it was just odd to me. But this movie focuses on a girl who's distraught about her mother dying and she wants to talk to her mom and, uh, she reaches out to Elise because some crazy spooky stuff has been happening and everybody goes to Elise because she's like a ghost buster. 
her. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, that's basically the whole movie, except in this movie, I think to be fair for the ranking system, we should also go off how good the antagonist is, which is usually like a ghost or a demon of some sort. I think that'll play into the score as well, because I just think that feels right, right? Which in the third one, spoilers once again, which, I mean, who the fuck is watching this? Um, the big demon's like a bird guy. It looks like he has a beak on, but it's really a gas mask. And the whole idea is that our main character, Quinn, oh, I, I was fucking right. It was James Wan was the theater director. Quinn, she gets basically trapped in this limbo where half of her, she gets hit by a car randomly, which is the best part of the movie. The rest of the movie is just like kind of forgettable, except there's this one part where she kicks her shins on like the edge of a bed. And then when she's walking, you can hear her broken legs like brittily breaking as she takes steps. It's very gruesome and fucking awesome. But her getting hit by the car is just, you know, it's it out of nowhere. It doesn't make any sense because you would have seen lights, heard the car coming. It's just blatantly out of nowhere. And that makes it pretty fun. But uh, in this one, it's like half Whoa. of her soul is taken by a demon and they have to get the other half back. And her other half of her soul is like a vegetable. She's basically just like a fucking like brain dead mutant. And they're like, we need to get this half of you back. I'd be like, why don't you just leave it? I mean, what fucking, what, what good is this to have? Fucking eyeless fucking like drone of a person. Just leave them, let them have it. Because the bird, I keep saying bird. Was it even like a really a beak? It's just a gas mask or it's like an oxygen mask. This like demon with an oxygen mask is like coddling her and you know, it's like he wants her to stay with him forever and it's, you know, kind of creepy or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's still just really stupid. And I was just like, just leave it. What the fuck? Like you can exist with half a soul, I imagine, but at least in this one, we get more of her, which uh, this really the Insidious series could be called a, uh, a couple different things, which is Doors Creek, Violins Squeal, or Elise gets choked because that happens a lot in every single film you are going to see Lin Shay get choked out. Show yourself. Out of all four movies, I think there's at least probably at least 30 minutes of Lin Shay getting choked, which is a lot in the grand scheme of like having that be on camera. That's a long time. But I mean, I don't know. All of the, It's just that the story isn't very strong. It's just really stupid. The Insidious franchise is also really bad about their final acts are always super, super like kind of just like, uh. They just throw it out there like that, and they're like, that's the end. Oh, we dealt with the, we dealt with the monster, which a lot of times too, actually almost every time, I feel like the way they solve the monster is they hit it with a lantern. Usually people, whenever people get hit in this movie, they fly 70 feet back, but then if a demon gets hit, they fly like really far into a spooky darkness. But all in all, I mean like, just like kind of a forgettable movie, really. I mean, I know this is the worst rated one out of the franchise, and I know this is the one that made the least amount of money, but I mean, still, it made like a huge profit. This is extremely successful commercialized series. So like none of them flopped, you know, it's that's not the case. But in terms of like, you know, rewatchability, this movie was just a fucking bore. You know, a lot of moments dozing off, which granted we, you know, this is the third one in the franchise. So we were kind of tired to begin with watching it. But in this movie also, let's let's let, let's have like a nice docket of what happens. Uh, Lin Shay does get strangled. Gotta put that up there. You see the spooky demon fall into a cartoon uh, circle pit when Lin Shay does like a force stomp and <laughs> he like falls through the bottom of the floor. That's pretty cool. Dermot Mulroney, the dad from Screen 6 is in it and he's just as terrible as he is in Screen 6 in this movie. So that tracks pretty well. You do see people get smacked and they fly 70 feet. So that's fun too. So yeah, it has all the normal nuances of what we need to do. And it does feel like in a way, like they do like the upside down. I feel like Stranger Things kind of took a lot from this series. Did you feel the same or no? At least the first season. The first season of Stranger Things feels very reminiscent. Like when I was watching back, I was like, oh, this feels like the first season trying to get that fucking kid. The kid who's like comatose or whatever. And they're like, we have to go the upside down and fight zombies or aliens or whatever the fuck it is. Demigorgons. Insidious chapter three, bottom of the list by far. Stinker. Coming in hot at number three is Insidious Chapter 2. I feel like Insidious Chapter 2 really could have been last. In a lot of ways, it feels like Halloween 2, where the first one was such a success that they're like, there is no possible way we're not going to just make a second one. And we don't care how bad it is, we're gonna do it. And it might not make any sense at all, but that's what we're doing. And that's kind of how this felt, because the first movie ends on a bit of a cliffhanger where you're like, ooh, but this whole movie is a response to that cliffhanger. And it's, it's just all kind of very forgettable. Really, it's the worst monster in all of them, which is just the dad getting possessed by the Black Bride ghost named Mary Lee. The ghost's name is like Mary Lee or something. What is that? 
what the fuck just happened? Anyways, it's like a ghost named Mary Lee, but it's a guy. You find out it's a guy because his mom freaked out because he's like, oh, her dad abandoned the family and she like had a fucking mental breakdown. And basically the kid dresses like his mom and kills it. It feels very Red Dragon to me. If you've ever seen the movie Red Dragon, that's like a prequel to Silence of the Lambs. And that's all about the same thing, which is also basically a rehash of Psycho. Crazy kid kills people. But the whole thing is that this murderer has now become like a demon and kills people. It has some interesting moments where the dad's possessed and he turns on people and you see Patrick Wilson just beat the shit out of people. And that's kind of fun. And he kind of like is slowly aging too, which is kind of funny. He's just like, I'm old, everything's fine. It's kind of funny because how he's gaslighting his wife. Like they just went through that episode. Yeah. Being haunted. He's like, it doesn't exist. Yeah, so, <laughs> so in this movie, it's very funny because Patrick Wilson, Mr. Lambert, is uh, gaslighting the shit out of his wife the whole time, which Insidious Chapter 2 just feels like I gaslight my wife. That's what it should be called. I think it's been like a month since the last movie or something in terms of time that's passed, and still shit is just going on crazy, and this family has moved like four times in the last three months, and she's like, yeah, uh, there's still crazy shit happening. He's like, would you just get over it? Like, it's done. Like, leave it alone already. It's fine. The whole time. Once again, this movie, if it wasn't so kind of stupid and funny, I feel like it would be last place because it's just, it's so bad, but it's so bad in the way that, like, it's so obvious that he's, like, possessed and, like, feel like everybody should just be like, oh, he's possessed. And it's also funny because he's not in prison after he just strangled Elise in the first movie. So it's just this man walking free and people are just like, yep, an old woman died by a strangle thing. It matches your husband's hand prints immediately. Ah, we'll figure it out. You're like, what? Okay. You know, and in, in the Insidious movies, it's a lot about astral pro projecting, right? Astral projecting, which is where like your spirit can go and go into the different dimensions or through the universe or whatever and talk to dead people. Ooh. In this movie, there's a part where Elise's old partner, Carl, who comes back and helps. He has a big pocket full of dice the whole movie. It's like the most obnoxious thing. He's like walking around being like, oh, what the, uh, should I eat a hot pocket? And he like rolls it and like, it's a big jumbling of words. And he just like makes his own conclusion. So sometimes, like sometimes it rolls into a word, but the majority of the time he's just like, oh my God, it says uh, Miango. That's probably something that probably means yes. So I should just eat the hot pocket, I guess. But he gets bitch slapped or he gets hit. He gets supposedly killed somehow. And he shows up in the spirit dimension to meet uh, Patrick Wilson. And he's just like, well, shit, I guess I'm dead. They're walking around the dark and uh, they find Elise and she's like an angel now, <laughs> like kind of like walking around being like, I was in heaven, but I decided to come back and help you. And they're like, that's awesome. And she's like, but by the way, Carl, you're still alive. I feel your heartbeat, which is just funny because it's like, did I, when I hit my head, did I just astral project automatically? Was there just a button I pressed? So it's pretty fun. Once again, Insidious, right on, right on cue. It has one of the worst endings, which is just Elise looking at nothing, being like, oh my God. God, uh, which I think we're going to know what that means in this last movie or in the newest movie coming out, but we'll see. I mean, you know, when they made this, this was literally a decade ago, so I don't know how they're going to wrap it up with that, but uh, it's pretty good, which, uh, you know, and to, yeah, it's a little intermission break here. Insidious, the franchise as a whole, not even one particular movie. That's why I didn't really include it into my rating. All of the scripts are extremely poorly written. Like, I don't think you can blame the actor. I just think it's really bad. It's a bad script and probably like a one take willy. That's how it felt a lot of the time. They're just like, we got it. It's fine. We only have $75,000 to make this movie, but don't worry guys, we're going to make $160 million in the box office. So it'll be good. I promise. No one's going to care. People who are showing up to watch Insidious in the theaters, they're not going to care about this. They're just going to be like, when's the next ghost scene? I want more ghosts. I didn't include that into the rating because it's just across the board. It's like, yeah, there might be some that are worse than others, but it's just a mess all around. You like you catch yourself sitting there being like, is that really? That's what we settled on? That was also the take we took? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Pretty silly. But now we're moving up into the big leagues. Usually it takes us a while to get in the top three, but I think the top two is better. What's coming in at number two for me personally is Insidious Chapter One, or just Insidious One, which is, this is the beginning of the franchise. You know, we get to settle in with the Lamberts for the first time. And like I said, this is supposed to be the scariest movie ever, I think is what I read based off people's heart rate. 
Nights, which is that one scene where they're in like a dining room and then there's the spooky devil behind Patrick Wilson's head. That's iconic. And then, you know, the whole movie is pretty, like, I, I think so many people copied the format of what this was. James Wan had had success with Saul before this, but like, I feel like this was the thing that really catapulted him into being like, oh, everything I make is going to make hundreds of millions of dollars and it will cost essentially nothing because he just found a great way to be like, let's rent out a house and just kind of, we'll just creak doors open. And that's, it's worked. You have to give him, he's doing something right. Credit is where credit is due, James Juan. Even though I think Malignant's still the best thing he's made because it's just so stupid. I think he tried to make something really cool, but it came off as like the most expensive B-horror film of all time, which is sick. And I think it made probably the least amount of money of any of his films. So good on you, James Juan. Love you. This film has like a lot of the iconic shit where it's like, you start to see that archetype from James Wan's movie where it's like giant, like Victorian house, huge, huge house. And the dad, Patrick Wilson is a public school teacher and the wife is a stay-at-home mom. And the property is probably like, I mean, this is, has to be like a $25 million house in California. I mean, it's fucking massive. Like, it's like as distracting as like watching like a sitcom, like New Girl, where it's like, aren't they all like and poor? <laughs> but yet they live in like this $70,000 a month loft. It's like in the grand scheme of things, it's like, who cares? That's just where they live. But it's just distracting to me. And then it's even more distracting because then they have enough equity to just move like two times in the movie. Like move houses. Because I think that they're like, well, why don't people just move out? Like that's like a big thing that people say. If I was living there, I'd just move. So I think that James Wan was probably like, hey, we should have a move real quick. And then they still get haunted. <laughs> and then they, you're like, you know what? This house is probably haunted too. Let's go to another one. So it's like a bunch of different hauntings. And James Wan's like, it's in the budget. I'm pretty sure public school, this, yeah, James Wan's so successful at this point that he's like, I'm pretty sure public school teachers probably make like $7 million a year, right? That sounds about right, I think, to me. You have that archetype star. You also have uh, that fucking, that like, the violin. <laughs> which happens so much in this movie and it's become like a big TikTok sound too and it's like it's so grating by this point it's been done so much to where it's like really hard it's like listening to like Highway to Hell by ACDC where you're just like oh fuck I can't like not anymore I just sim I, I simply cannot anymore and then also uh, the tiptoe tiptoe Whatever the fuck that is, Tiny Tim, that song. The only reason that people think that that song is creepy is because Insidious put it in the movie and it made it all creepy. Some pretty major things happen that kind of have shaped kind of like horror in general for the past, like, I mean, almost 15 years. That's just kind of crazy to think. So you have to give the films props. At the end of the day, the script, once again, is so dated. Like a lot of the scares are really dated. Watching the first one to the fourth one, which obviously there's going to be an evolution. Watching like the first movie's jump scares compared to the last movie jump scares, it's pretty crazy. Like in the first film, when we do a jump scare, they really hold and linger on shit, and it completely takes all the wind of suspense and momentum out of the edit. So like all the jump scares feel super predictable. They don't feel earned. They feel kind of like very cheap, which the movie is only 1.5 million. Like I'm not trying to say like it needs to be some crazy thing, but the movie is just like, I mean, door creaking, loud noise, door creaking, loud noise, violin, ambiguous monster, violin, door creaking, loud Boys on the violin. It's how it feels. And then also, of course, don't forget Lin Shay Strangle. Which, you know, in this movie too, to be fair, I think out of all the endings in the franchise, this is the strongest ending out of all of them. And I think that like, it was the most inspired where it leaves you on a cliffhanger where it's like, what happens? Like, it, did the family die? Like, you know, what's going on? Which also becomes kind of a prominent thing too in like all of James Wan's movies where it's like, evil crazy thing happens, they subdue the evil, but then there's like one little ink droplet of like, they plant the seed of evil one more time. Time. Oops. It's not really over, actually. There's still a ghost that's gonna strangle Lin Shay. We have to keep strangling Lin Shay no matter what we do. And like, you know, in terms of the monster in this one too, it's like the super iconic red devil thing. But I think that the reason that this one probably wasn't number one was because at the end of number three and four, they do jump scares with the devil guy because it's like a precursor to this film. But chapter three, the ending is so egregiously bad that it, you, you can't take that monster seriously anymore just like it's so it's like looks like a fucking like carnival character like you're like okay and it holds on it for too long and it's like ah. and then it cuts it's way too long i'm gonna do that again all right so there's lin shay standing here and then he comes in he's just like ah. 
and then it cuts. You know how long that is? It's a long time. Like, that's not a jump scare. That's like a, oh, is this a new scene? And then it cuts off, and you're like, oh, okay. And then in the fourth movie, he's just kind of in the window. He goes, <laughs> which I know back in the day, I was super scared by the devil design. It's like interesting and simple and fun. It's kind of, it's like almost tribal or it feels like a, it feels like something that would have come off like a wall painting or something, which is fun. I like that design, but all in all, Insidious 1, it's just, it, it's not the best one of the franchise. It's, it, it's a watchable movie, but at the end of the day, it's, it feels just so dated. It's just crazy. It's really unbelievable. It's pretty funny to see like how that archetype has just been completely, people have just stolen from that. James Wan has just, I mean, Insidious is a, is a cow and he has milked that fucking thing bone dry, dude. But luckily coming in at number one is Insidious chapter four, the last key, Chronicles of Narnia, the last key. This movie came out five years after chapter three, which was the longest time between movies. Usually they're about two to three years between each movie. Chapter three was 2013 wow. and chapter four was 2018. And dramatically, the pacing of the movie is much stronger. This movie just follows basically, it's a sequel to chapter three, which is a prequel. So it's a sequel to that. And this movie is supposed to be like a couple months before the first movie. We're finding our groove again. And once again, I think that like this movie only shows that like Elise is the strongest character out of all of them. I think that once again, I think that they realized like immediately after the first movie and especially probably after the second movie, they're like, this family is not interesting enough to keep this franchise alive. We should have just done a fucking like X-Files thing with Elise. So we're following her and we get to learn more about her childhood. It's a more inspired movie. I think it was also the first one that wasn't directed by James Wan. I think he only produced it. So they brought in a new director, or probably a new writer, and they just had a stronger idea of what they wanted to do. It almost makes you think that like maybe the director want, like pitched this movie to someone else and they're like, oh, why don't we just make this an insidious film? It's kind of how it felt like because the ideas were so vastly original compared to the other ideas in the franchise as well. So you, it, it really does feel like, oh, this was probably another idea because this movie is so much stronger, which in terms of the monster design, it's a big guy, big creepy guy, which, you know, they, they never get the faces right. It's just a creepy fish man looking thing without an upper lip that has stringy black hair. Ooh, he's big and gangly. Ooh, but he does have cool, uh, his fingers so are keys cool. and he does a cool ritual where he like puts one of the keys in your throat and it silences, it like cuts off your scream and it silences your voice. And then he like puts one another key into your chest and unlocks your titties in a way. So it's like, it's like he's like locking you in the in-between or whatever. It just felt more inspired. The whole ritual feels more inspired and the history of the home feels more inspired, which there's a lot of cool payoffs in the movies. Like a couple examples of that is uh, like Elise as a character you see as her girl and she's like kind of tortured by her dad who is this fucking like monster that works at this prison. I think he blames Elise for the suicide of his wife. So it's like this really temeculous. Teme is that a word? Temeculous? Tumultuous. Us. Whatever. They have a rough relationship. There's a great moment where Elise is talking to a ghost in a closet and there's this girl and she looks all ransacked and she does look dead. Her little brother is all like, Elise, stop. You're scaring me. And then she's like, my brother doesn't believe you're here. Could you come out and talk to him? And sure enough, the dad comes up and he's like, there's nothing in here, you dumb bitch. Jesus Christ. I'm going to hit you with this cane again. But it turns out later that her dad was possessed by the ghost and like holding women captive. And that ghost that she saw earlier was actually a captive woman, which connects well because earlier in the film as well, Elise is called back to her family home, which is like a weird coincidence, which felt like too much of a coincidence in a way, but she's called back to her home and this guy is trying to like renovate his house and just like not lose his house because he put all of his money into it. But it turns out that he's also a creep that has like a woman locked up. It plans to see that this ghost has a motive and it has a way that it likes to collect its souls, which feels fun and inspired. You know, I like that. They do like a lot more better, like suspenseful reveals of characters like because they know that in this whole franchise it's been nothing but jump scares so they play a lot more with like the pacing and timing of that because they know that the audience is educated by this point people can like sense when a jump scare is coming <laughs> because people are really dumb when they make movies and they're just like at the ending of a movie when it's like all right well it's like nice peaceful music well, we won't be seeing any more of those ghosts and it's nice and as she's like walking away all of the music dies down and it's silent and she's like hm. 
It starts walking, you're like, yeah, okay, jump scare in three seconds, and then sure enough, it happens. So this movie does a great job like that. Like, there's this great transition where you see this, like, dark figure walking behind her, and as she turns around, it turns into, like, a suit that's, like, hanging up on a curtain. I just thought that was a great edit. Same thing, too. <clears throat> a girl is walking in a basement, and as she's walking by a column, you just kind of barely see a form kind of move off screen. Just very tastefully done. It's nice. You still, don't get me wrong, this isn't, like, a, the pinnacle of fucking, like, taste. There's still plenty of cheesy fucking jump scares coming out of, like, three cases and loud creaking doors and you get some violins here and there and some giant red fucking doors like that's in every other movie but it's still really good one of the guys who's on elisa's team he's in every movie too it's just like one of the two guys he's the small frumpy nerdy one not the fat tall uh nerdy one small weaselly ben shapiro guy is walking around and the crazed homeowner who's locked everybody in the basement is walking around the house with a gun and he is able to hit him in the back of the head and it's gun falls out and he's clearly blacked out like the guy looks totally subdued and you're like okay he's gonna call the cops but instead he takes like a two-ton fucking cabinet and smashes the guy to death and you're like that was that feels excessive there's a great cheesy line from lynn shay where she's just like you know our job is to stop demons in the other world but you stopped one in the real world you stopped a demon in the real world i'm gonna kiss you on the mouth <laughs> <laughs> she said that. That'd be nice. But you know, some melodramatic family stuff that happens in the movie, it's fine. But all in all, I think this is the strongest one. I mean, at the very beginning, the dad locks the daughter in this like fucking like super scary basement. And he obviously like abuses her and hits her. And the mom is just like, well, I'm a 1950s housewife, so I won't step out of line. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. But then she's like supposed to be the beacon of like protection at the end. Did you find that to be odd? I was like, if I saw my mom who had done nothing but watched me get beaten and tortured for the like my whole life until she killed herself which you know the ghost killed her but still if i was in need of help and she blows this whistle out of the shadow steps the 1950s housewife mom i'd be like can there be another fucking ghost that can help me right now instead of this like weak backbone bitch are you kidding me like come on man like even the possessive dad who was just like i'm sorry i was possessed i had no idea i shouldn't have been so wrong to you and he helps her out that feels way stronger than just push over wife who's just like yeah by the way i'm gonna slap this demon with a lantern and that's just the end of that demon cool what a fucking cool way that is and she's like by the way i'm not i'm also not gonna apologize at all for watching you get tortured for the whole fucking movie it's unbelievable that's the thing about the insidious films that sucks is that they all have like something kind of good about them but it's almost always foreshadowed by something absolutely terrible so there's no real way to like stack it up and i it really you just have to stack it up with like i said creature design was a kind of funny where some of the scares good and i think out of all of them and yeah it's not a perfect film but i do think insidious 4 at least captures that fun vibe of like it's just a well-rounded movie out of all of them if you had to be devil's advocate i mean i would say insidious chapter 4 has to be the best one especially getting away from the fucking lamberts dude who gives a fuck about the lamberts i don't even think james wan did either i think that it was just maybe supposed to be a one and done kind of movie creepy cheap paranormal movie that has now cast him into making the fucking conjuring series with the nun and the Annabelle and all that stuff too and now he's in hell I imagine he must be in hell except he got to make Malignant which you haven't, if you haven't seen Malignant you gotta do yourself a favor and see it because it's hilarious it's so funny I simply cannot stress enough how funny <laughs> Malignant is I'll have to do a video on it someday it's really funny but uh that's my ranking so let's go over it again dead last insidious chapter three coming in at third insidious chapter two coming in at second insidious and coming in at number uno Insidious 4. And Insidious 5 comes out soon. The Red Door. Which it's like, dude, there's been a red door in every single one of these fucking movies. What a stupid title for it, though. That one red door, though. You remember that one? I'm pretty sure we said one line where we were like, oh, don't go in that red door. I can't remember I'm making it up. I don't know. But all I know is that we're going back to the Lamberts and their whole ad campaign is based off of him going into the MRI machine and then having the thing like crawl down the tunnel quickly. That's the only thing they have visually. Ever since then, I see crazy stuff in my dreams. They haven't shown Lynn Shay because she's probably going to have a surprise cameo or something. I'm, I'm not hopeful, I guess is the moral of the story. I am not hopeful for the red door. I think it's going to be played. If I had to get 
guess if I had to put it in anywhere, I, th I bet it's going to be in between the third and second. I'd place it. I, I bet you it's going to be fourth. Like, I don't I don't think it's going to be worse than chapter three. I don't think that'd be very hard. So I don't I, I doubt it. But that is my list of the Insidious movies. We swatched them all in one go. And my God, it's definitely not the worst thing. The fight probably Paranormal Activity was probably worse. Paranormal Activity was all really, really long. And by the end of that, you wanted to. Yeah, you wanted to have a demon possession. You could record it with the home security. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Thanks for watching. And I will see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses. Mwah. Seven hours of Lin Shay getting strangled made me extremely hard. <laughs> Seven hours of Lin Shay getting strangled, people getting slapped 70 feet and red doors has made me, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'll ever watch any of these movies again. I really didn't want to watch them before, but I, you know, I'm a slave to the algorithm, so hopefully Insidious Red Door does something for me. Fuck my life.